input. Thank you very much, panel. Now, over to you. Questions, please. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm guessing, that there's no here who doesn't have children. I just want to know how we explain that it's people who don't have children, whether they're your manager or whether they're people that you pass the baton to when you're not in the place. Who would like to take that one? Uh, something that we're doing um, at Mediacom is introducing a maternity coach, um, and that's a maternity coach to work with managers as well as the people going off on maternity leave before they go whilst they're off and when they come back. And that maternity coaching for managers is to explain exactly what's <laughs> exactly what we've all just discussed about that individual's going to be different. It's still the same person, but they're different when they come back because their priorities have changed, their blend has changed. So that's something that we're doing to make sure that managers understand it. Um, whether they're male or female, gender's not important, I think it's about having that empathy and making sure that they understand it. I think a lot of this stuff is, is, is cultural and actually if there is a, an awkward individual, which maybe there is in your case, that, that I think the culture needs to, uh, to show that that is not acceptable and leadership needs to show that that's not acceptable. Um, and that permeates everything and I think these days it's, it, it's about caring role, yeah? I mean it's not just those of us in the room who are lucky enough to be parents or, or going to be parents. There's the whole other way of it as well, the inverse, which is you know, people looking after parents. Um, mm. And that's the same thing, that's the same level of problems. And actually, if you are a culturally empathetic and understanding organisation that does not accept these people who make life difficult for other people, then you're in a much better place. But you need to role model it. I mean, we're, I'm in a very fortunate position where, you know, our top leadership is half female uh, in my company. That makes a difference because of the level of empathy that you get in uh, as well. Um, Karen's organisation is, is very female heavy at the top as well. I, I think that helps. I would say get yourself, get yourself a great husband who will share the load and get yourself a great employer who will be empath empathetic as well. And if you literally get to a point where you have an absolute impasse with somebody who's being a complete bitch or bastard, whichever way around it is, get out. Life's too short. Go and find yourself a company where you can actually be a hell of a lot happier and be yourself and be your authentic self. I think, I think that, sorry, I think that the role models point is, is really key and it's, it is something that culturally will change over time the more we have the positive role models and working parents with that added degree of flexibility and whatever blend they have but making sure that we're, we're allowing people to be good role models and supporting them to be good role models and so it will change over time, we've just got to kind of keep at it. I remember in the, um, in the mid 90s um, when uh, there were, I was at CIA at MEC, and uh, there were some people that um, were pregnant, and I remember some of the bosses were going, they've fallen pregnant, so they, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they fell on it, and they became pregnant. And it was the most horrendous thing, that they've fallen pregnant, and oh my God, what's gonna happen? And I think that attitude has changed, mm -hmm. completely changed because of the number of women that are making it work. But I do remember in the mid 90s it was this horrendous thing that they'd fallen on this pregnancy Fall stick. Fallen. Did you want to say anything else? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I also just wanted to be a little bit realistic about this as well, which is, because um, I think it's a fantastic question actually, because there is a sense that there's a preacher to the converted in this room, like everybody has that level of empathy. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I don't think, I, I think, you also need to acknowledge that I don't think you always can get people to understand that, which is why going back to a number of things that have been talked about here, which is focus on the work. Yeah, I think if you're not in that situation, it's really hard to understand why one thing is a priority or not. But if we take it back to the task that needs to be done and how that's being done, and I think that's the way to go in rather than to try and totally shift someone's world point of view when they just might not be in the position to be able to do that themselves. Next. Sam, you mentioned about um, the work of quite a female dominant, dominant of all the women in senior roles. How many of the men would do flexible working? Is that, again, something you mentioned? That's yeah. something that really frustrates me. We're changing the legislation next year so that it becomes shared 
which is a great thing. Realistically, though, in the first year, that's probably when baby needs them most, probably through feeding and all sorts of things, that's going to be trickier. But we have flexible working in place, and I think particularly in the sort of between one and they go to school, that would be when it would work best between parents, but I don't see a lot of men doing it. And I know it would be really tricky for my husband to do it in his role, mm. just culturally. Mm. And he does have a good theme of boss where he works, but still it would be difficult. So I'd just be interested in how many men do it. I think it's a fabulous question, and it's one that I've explored myself. So, so um, <laughs> as I said earlier on, I adopted um, uh, what, three and a half years ago now. In that situation, breastfeeding was not going to happen. Okay, I didn't therefore need to think about, uh, it didn't have to be me. And actually, I remember getting really bloody irritated because actually, the attachment parenting which you need to do when you're adopting, one of you absolutely needs to be there. But in our instance, we, Team Phillips, didn't actually want that to be me. We wanted that to be my husband. But actually, that wasn't going to work because I was going to get the maternity pay and leave, spend time with her, and he wasn't. Okay, and he was quite prepared to. He's, he, he's uh, you know, ex-army, whatever else. He's, he's a real man, but he was also very prepared to play that that role. Um, and I see it now. Legislation is coming in next year. Hurrah, hurrah! Um, I am not confident, if I'm being absolutely honest, that a lot of men are going to run out there and go, oh, "Brilliant! It's me at home then." After the wife has stopped breastfeeding, uh, I would love to be wrong on that. I think it'll probably be another generation or two before that becomes normalised. I, I know, I just like the Apple London, um, and I know that I am the very strange woman who goes to work every day to a lot of people there. I'm, I'm already the weirdo, yeah? If it was the husband, it was the one who's going to work every day, yeah, because they don't, yeah, they've, take, they've taken the role, not, no, nothing malicious intended, that's fine, that's their decisions. If it was a husband, well, that, that's a whole other world of, are you joking me? And I think for men coming back into the workplace and going, you know, I am going to take, uh, you know, six months paternity leave or paternity leave, I go, yeah, fantastic, because I'm sort of an equalist in life, you know? But I, 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 I wonder whether it's going to happen. Uh, I would love them to start even by doing four days a week and whatever else, and I think the best employers will embrace that. It will make things more complicated as an employer as well. Steve, Steve, the only man on the panel, what's your view on that one? Yeah, I'm a little bit more optimistic than Sam on that, actually, because particularly when I look at, I, I mean, to probably know thyself, yeah. for me, could I have done that? I don't know if I could have done, actually. I think I'd have found that really hard, but I know that there are many people that I work with that would have loved that opportunity. And there are many men, particularly uh, the generation that's coming through for whom they view that as a successful life. So I, I'm, I, I, I think with the legislature, I, my sense is they'll get used. I hope you're than, right. I really perhaps hope more you're than, right. um, yeah. than you might fear, Sam. But that's only in the right places where that's allowed to happen. Yeah. Any other comments or should we get to the next question? Next question. Oh. I want to talk a little bit about, the, I suppose, the awkward beginning bit. So I think relatively in the industry, I think I'm actually quite young to have a kid, 29, or 30, 31 when I'm like second, who's coming in January. And I think a lot of the people I talk to, we've got CMOs and CSOs and MDs. I think a lot of people I talk to in our agency, when we talk about it, oh, it's really, really hard. And then I actually find out, you know, they're actually earning so much money, they've got their own full-time nanny, or their wife's given up work. It's quite awkward. My wife and I cannot afford to do that. And I think to your point, Steve, we're all going to be level pegging. We come and say, great, one of us got made redundant, and then we'd be able to make a proper decision about it, sort of salary wise. How did you do that at the beginning? So, with childcare and just making that work? So, I know we find it a real struggle. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean and, and it is. I remember looking at our, <coughs> you know, doing our finances and going, there's more going out than is coming in. And there and that, that genuinely was for a period of time, and it terrified me. So, I don't think there, there isn't an easy part to that. But we did get through it. And I think that's the sense that you, you know you do go through. I think there's there's practical parts of this which you just need to acknowledge up front. Um, and I, I, I honestly don't think Sophie felt that same level of anxiety around that that I did. Yeah, you know, that made me nervous. Um, we just the house, we had a load of rebuild to do. I was like shit. In fact, I do remember because um, our two were closer together than we thought, and the Fred was one. The back of the house was off. Money was really hard, and. It's when Fred was still sleeping in the afternoon, it was in December, and we were wrapping presents in our bedroom, and 
So said that. Um, Actually, I feel, a bit, I feel a bit sick. And it, I, I genuinely wish I could put his words back in my mouth. And I went, you don't think you're pregnant, are you? Because that would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> and then she went, well, I think I might be. And I was like, oh, man. So, so far, a pregnancy test on that Monday, he came home. And, I, and it was totally different to the first time. The first time I was like, yay, amazing. And the second time I was like, OK, so we're going to have to convert that loft earlier than we thought. You know? and, and, and we did, and it was a stretch, and it was hard. But you do get through that bit. I think w one of the things, particularly from a guy's perspective, that's underestimated is I felt quite alone in those first few months as well, in those first six months. I think there was a, there's such a love affair going on between mother and child that I felt. Uh, and I, I do see, kind of see a couple of my mates, you know, they go a little bit off the rails sometimes. You, you do see that, guys go out a bit more, and, and I think that is partly because that emotional richness that they had with their partner up until then is taken from them, is, is how it felt, because there's an intense relationship going on that, to be honest, you're sort of on the outskirts of quite often. And there's, so there's a combination of facts, and I do think the early part was hard. I, I, I wish success to, to you both. Uh, in making that work. But it, it's a question of riding out the ebbs and flows. Vicky, can you give us your view on that? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting when you talk about money, basically, because we looked at the numbers and did exactly that. When I came back on a three-day week, which I wasn't expecting, we then sat and did the numbers on James being a nursery and, and me being at work, and it didn't stack up. So quite frankly, we were just about breaking even. Um, uh, but we, we, were in it, we decided we were in it for the long term. So um, I am, you know, dedicated to my career. I'm passionate about what I do. I didn't want to compromise on that. So um, we took the hit. So um, it's going to be tight and tough for the next, you know, however long. But there's a, a greater good coming, you know, down the line. Maybe. <laughs> um, so that's what we kind of focus on. Was in the short term, there's pain, but in the long run, it will be work out. Like you say, you just have to ride it out. Any other comments? Anyway. Yeah, I, I guess the thing that we did was we looked at lots of different options because you know sort of one size does not fit all so we did a combination of nursery which is expensive but necessary because it provides that child care during the day we weren't we didn't want to have a child mind <coughs> because we wanted um, the boys to have you know sort of more sociable time and learning more and more structured as well so that they could achieve all their goals um, <laughs> but, then, but then also um, we needed that extra flexibility after nursery finishes yeah. because nursery finishes at six o'clock and if you're five minutes late you get fined and if you're ten minutes late you get a bigger fine and so suddenly you're having this huge impact on your finances and so we kind of went right what can we do to make our lives just easier and so we decided to um, invite an au pair into our house and that's worked brilliantly for us absolutely brilliantly and having an au pair has meant that my husband and I get to go out twice a week because you're, you're you know sort of you have you have on tap babysitting um, it's meant that if either one of us is running late then there's somebody there to actually pick up the kids and make sure that they're safe they're getting home they're getting fed they're having a bath you know and so having having an au pair it does mean having somebody else live in your house and so it meant that we were all sort of a bit squeezed in at times. But that's the way we made it work. And it's the, probably the most cost effective way I've, I've found. And I looked at, you know, I've done spreadsheets of everything. So I would recommend look at lots of different options. Can I just add something? Mm. Um, when I had uh, my son, I didn't expect to be on my own, and I was on my own. And uh, I didn't have room to have somebody else in my home. And what I ended up doing was making friends of everybody in my road to find out who else had kids. And I also became really friendly with the nursery that I had Isaac at. And that bit that I was saying at the very beginning, which is ask for help, I literally had an arrangement with the nursery, which is one of Isaac's favorite uh, nursery teachers to take Isaac home, or one of the parents on um, the road would collect Isaac if I couldn't do it. So that bit about asking for help, you will find help and you will find a way by hook or by crook. And that's what I did. So there is a financial thing involved, but it's also if you ask for help, you'll find some people will step up. They really will. Because I do have a genuine sense that people are good people. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I completely concur with that. I think, you know, anyone who tells you you can do it by yourself, you know, you literally, whether you're a single mum or, 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 or a couple, it, it, it is just too hard. One of the fascinating things about doing uh, adoption uh, is that the social works worker asks you all sorts of questions. Some are bizarre, you think why, but some are actually really good. And one of the things that they asked us was how long we lived uh, in this area. And they really tried to establish your like community map. Uh, the reason being, if you haven't lived in the in that area, in that house, for at least a couple of years, they simply won't let you adopt. Because they know the support networks that you will have to have to make this thing work. And I know it's one piece of advice I give to people, you know, is if you're gonna have babies, go to where you're going to have those babies and bring them up and be there for a couple of years and start to establish a network. Don't do what a lot of people do, which is they have the babies, they get this NCT network around and whatever else, and a couple of years later they move. Guess what? They're quite lonely for a while, yeah? Until the kids go to school and you can establish your next new networks. So it's one of those strange things. I moved back to where my parents were because, do you know what? They've been rocks and amazing, and when you have those urgent things of one child, finger falling off or, you know, can't breathe or whatever, you need people there to, to, to help you. So really get a support network around you. You do have to dig into your pocket. I totally agree, you play the long game. Um, you know, I laugh sometimes and I think, oh my gosh, I've got a lady here doing the ironing, I've got the nanny here, and the window cleaner came as well on Saturday, and I'm like, man, there's a lot of money going out. But without that, you can't actually keep everything going uh, and keep the wheels on the bus. And if you want to keep the wheels on the bus and be a working parent for both of you, those are some of the choices that you have to make, and just don't feel bad about making them, they're fine. I Anyone think lives in Chiswick, I might be around for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one quick last question, if there is one. You're 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 Never. Come on, we won't. That's fine. Well, something I'd like to share um, and, and ask a question about. Um, is something that kind of a point that Steve made earlier about when you're returning after paternity and on maternity, you do feel empowered you are, you know the real reasons why you're, why you're working. Um, and one thing that I found when returning um, to work after uh, after my paternity is I'm actually feeling really guilty about leaving my partner with, uh, with our newborn son. Um, and one thing that we continually I think, struggle with is trying to find time for each other in, in all of this. Um, that's one thing that we're, we're continually trying to. Just a question that um, I would like, I'd uh, 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 definitely uh, I'd love for you guys to share is again how you organise time to uh, would your partner, would you would be like a or, or with friends uh, and, and etc. and how how that works for you or, or how it doesn't work. Um, I can't, I can't remember. I, I, I've, got, I've got the mic, so um, I guess mine, mine sort of pulls back to the last question that we have no pair and that's the thing that allows us two nights babysitting a week and that means that, so Friday night is kind of our sacred, we go out and we see our mates and we probably drink too much, you know, we, we, we allow ourselves still to do some of the things that we used to do before we had the kids and then we can have another night that's flexible and sometimes we manage to... Um, you know, we, man we manage to meet up, and other times we're doing our own thing, we're seeing other people, we're continuing, you know, sort of building our own networks. But it is really, really important to have the time for the two of you and to remind yourselves, you know, sort of why you first fell in love, and, you know, and, and also that, you know, that, that family time too is, it is key. So carve out that space, find, you know, sort of find somebody from your network that can take your child or your children for a couple of hours just so you can go for a walk in the park. Something like that, and it, it makes a difference because you talk again, because you can't talk when children are around, and particularly as they get older, because they want to be involved in the conversation. Then, so sorry, I said I was really quick. And then, one, um, one other response, if there is. A quick I, one. I'll go from it. Sorry, just very quickly in terms of what we do without using us. So there's one way of doing it: using the support network. There's another way of doing it, which I can't believe I'm actually going to say out loud. But we have um, no phone Fridays. So um, no phone Friday is we're not allowed to sit in front of the TV looking through um, our social network, sorry. Um, but we also, um, we have a theme tonight. So on a Friday night, we have to play this This is so tragic, but um, I'm, I am actually saying it's not. So um, we have like American night, 
So we put American music on, we make burgers, we have you know, chips. Please don't laugh at me. Um, and then we have the next week, we'll do Mexican night, and we do the same thing. Because we can't get out. So we, we're very lucky. I live near my parents. We draw on both sides of parents, so we can get out. But when that's not possible, and we've used up all our credits, what can we do to make sure we spend some time together? And it's just that investment of time. It doesn't always work. Sometimes we look at our phones. But be nice. No phone Friday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just before I ask the team for their...